Do you believe in magic? Yes. Miami. It starts with the heat. I'm not talking about the basketball team, but the gleam that comes from the beams of the sun. It's not the least bit fun. If rays were inescapable, I would run fast. But I still believe. What's hard to conceive is how car after car, filled with people from near and far, who go to work or from the bar, don't know how to drive. <laughs> and hey, who would even think that the habit to save us all would ever go extinct? R.I.P. the turning signal. But I still believe in the magic. I believe in the sounds. Latin music blasting all around. The dominoes of Little Havana slapping on tables. Pound, pound, pound. Oh, yeah! I believe in the words, bro. Like, for real, yo. Like how no, yeah, means yes, and how yeah, no, means no. Whoa. The auditory sensations range from Cubans in the South to the North with the Haitians, and that's only a fraction of all of the nations. These are my Miami people. You are in a city that puts the city after diverse. A melting pot so hot it would make your abuela want to curse, which is why I, as a local, thank you for being here. Good theater tells stories of people and places. Great theater tells truthful tales that transcend through various spaces and races and is laced with you. You are the weave, a group of folks who have suspended their disbeliefs over and over, which is why I believe in the magic to TCG and all of those in between who let this little Haitian boy share some words you have received. Enjoy your time. Take a breath and absorb every piece of magic this city has to offer. So when I ask you this question, yes, is what you will holler. Do you believe in magic? Yes. Do you believe in magic? Yes. Welcome to the magic city, Miami. Thank you, Joshua Jean Baptiste, for that hot welcome. Welcome to Miami. And welcome to TCG's 29th National Conference. We are so glad you're here. There are close to 900 of you, and to the 40% who are here for the first time at a TCG conference, we extend a very special welcome to you. While this is our kickoff plenary, we've already been here for, for several days, and I just wanted to give you a, a little glimpse at some of the things we've been doing. We've had several pre-conference -con gatherings, including two Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Institute meetings, a meeting of the Fox Foundation Resident Actor Fellows, our Rising Leaders of Color, and Education Directors pre-conference, and a convening of theater in higher education. That's Amazing. So thanks to each and everyone in this room for your commitment to our art form, to the health and vitality of our theater field, and to our potential for collective action through advocacy and activism. In case you don't know me already, I'm Teresa Eyring, Executive Director of TCG, and a recent convert to the magic of Magic City. In our prep visits here, I was struck by the strength, power, and innovation within the arts and cultural communities, as well as the welcoming spirit of the people. For our field, it's a particularly good time to visit because this city has much to teach us about thriving in a time of constant change. For in many ways, 
The future of our country is already here in Miami. People of color make up 88% of the population. There may, <laughs> there may be some truth in the old joke that people love Miami because it's so close to the United States. <laughs> and in part, because of its rich history of immigration, the culture here is truly representative of the broader America uh, broader Americas as well as the Caribbean. We also meet only 45 minutes away from Parkland where a group of theater kids changed the conversation about gun violence last year. Here in Miami, communities of color have long been taking grassroots action to change our country's culture of pervasive gun violence. Earlier today, we held a session on how theaters can respond to that culture through our work on stage, and we'll report out on that at our How We Move Forward gathering on Friday. We also invite you to wear orange as part of a national consciousness raising action on Friday, which is National Gun Violence Awareness Day, and we'll take a post-plenary picture together in the beautiful night concert hall at the Adrian Arsht Center. Miami is also on the front lines of climate change. Xavier Cortada, TCG's first ever artist in residence at a conference, is one of the many Miami activists leading climate actions. And I wanted to extend a very special thank you to our climate committee who have done so much to weave climate action into the fabric of this conference. And I'd like, to, I'd like to just take a moment and ask uh, the committee members who are here to just please stand or signal as you are able so that we can recognize you. Thank you. We also know that people of color and indigenous peoples have been stewarding the climate for generations. We acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Seminole and the Miccosukee, and that the wealth of the city and that our and our country, the wealth of the city and that of our country was built by enslaved peoples from many African countries. To help us honor the land, I'm pleased to welcome Houston Cypress of the Miccosukee tribe. Welcome, so good to see you. And um, I'm glad to be with you all as we give some consideration to our relationships to the land, to history and community and reconciliation. Um, I've been really impressed to hear uh, this land acknowledgement that my friend Elizabeth Dowd and the TCG team have been composing and using here. And I encourage you to refer to it because it has some great actionable items. Now these um, sorts of public ceremonies are done in the spirit of um, reconciliation. And I wanna continue working with y'all and collaborating with y'all as we aspire to do this. And so here we find ourselves in the second month of the wet season here in, in South Florida. And my community marks this time of the year with spiritual festivities. And some of the principles that we honor are things like knowledge of community. So whenever we get together, we always try to make sure to learn something from each other and from our elders. So in that spirit, I'd like to honor and um, offer some of the lessons that I've learned from the indigenous communities here, my extended family. And I want to start off with one of the communities that's not federally recognized, which is the council of the original Miccosukee Seminole Nation of Aboriginal peoples. And one of the great lessons that I've learned from this community is that to be a human to achieve our humanity is one of the greatest daily practices that one can honor. And from the Seminole tribe of Florida, I am perpetually impressed by the way that they continue to redefine and expand notions of sovereignty. Now from my own home community, the Miccosukee tribe of Florida, I wanna share that we have a decolonial scientific method that's based on our traditional ecological knowledge. And that's how we protect the greater Everglades. So our successes are based on the language and the storytelling. So I'm glad that that's something that we can build on together as storytellers. 
So I invite you all to come on out to the greater Everglades and learn more about the living stories that are part of the circle of life out there. Now, land acknowledgments in spirit of reconciliation and restoration and reparation, we must honor and uplift the stories of our black families and the histories of forced removal of people from African lands brought to these lands. We gotta uplift those and embrace those stories and those family members. As well as honoring the family that we have in immigrant communities and people coming to these lands, we gotta honor and uplift and love their stories too. So I just wanted to say that I'm really looking forward to sharing these stories with each and every one of y'all here. And so it's an honor to share this space with y'all. Thank you very much. That was really beautiful, thank you, Houston. Miami is a multilingual city where English and Spanish are joined by 128 different languages spoken in homes. That's because Miami is also a city of immigrant success stories, as we've heard, including vibrant Muslim, Middle Eastern, and North African communities. We take heart from those stories, even as we witness xenophobic policies proliferate at the state and federal level, because just as the sea level is rising, just as the sea level is rising, oops, I lost my space here. Um, so too is the individual personal stress aggravated by the daily news cycle. As a result of these trends and daily pressures, we are seeing, and our friends at the Actors Fund have corroborated, a marked increase in theater people seeking mental health support. It was also widely expressed concern at our November Fall Forum on Governance, which focused on organizational culture. Those are some of the reasons we focused one of our three conference tracks on wellness and well being. Joining tracks on theater journalism, as well as audience and community engagement and development, I hope you feel that we're always trying to bring you programming you can't find in quite the same way anywhere else. Our goal is not only to address some of the pressing issues in our theater ecology today, but also provide skills building around topics like marketing, fundraising, governance, and of course, to make new friends and keep the old ones. I now wanna thank our conference funders and sponsors. I'm gonna speak their names and ask you to please hold the, your applause until the end. Stephanie Anson and Spencer Stewart. Arts Consulting Group, Audience View, the Sherry and Les Biller Family Foundation, Charcoal Blue, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, Dramatist Play Service, the Ruth Easton Fund, the Edgerton Foundation, Fisher Dax Associates, the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau, H3 Architectonica, the Hearst Foundations, the Howard Gilman Foundation, the Institute of Financial Wellness for the Arts, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Management Consultants for the Arts, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, MDC Live Arts, the Miami-Dade County Col Department of Cultural Affairs, the, Mi the Miami New Drama Board of Directors, the National Endowment for the Arts, Patron Manager, the Regional Arts Commission of St. Louis, Spectrix, Starkweather and Shepley, the Wallace Foundation, Schuler Shook, Theater Planning and Lighting Design, Theater Projects, TRG Arts, Vendini, and Wells Fargo. <laughs> yes. I'd also, also like to offer a special thanks to the sponsors of this plenary session, Miami-Dade County, the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, and Stephanie Anson and Spencer Stewart. Thank you so much. <laughs> Finally, I just want to lift up our Miami Honorary Committee, which is comprised of several nationally prominent theater artists, civic and philanthropic leaders who live in or are from Miami. Uh, you can see their names here. Take a minute to look. 
And again, just huge thanks to them for their leadership as artists and community leaders. Um, now, it's my immense pleasure to welcome to the stage our host committee co-chairs, Beth Boone and Michelle Hausman. <laughs> Do y'all feel that? Do y'all feel that? Jig it out. Entonces, in the palabras immortales of Willard Carroll Smith Jr., we say, welcome to Miami. Bienvenidos a Miami. Akei a Miami. Bruhim abayim le Miami. Achlan bich a Miami. How y'all doing? Como esta mi gente? All right. It is my great honor to introduce you a trailblazer of an artistic leader, a woman who arrived in Miami during the Artistic Ice Age. And through Miami Light Project, the organization she leads gave artists time, resources, and space so that a new generation of world-class artists flourished and not only transformed the local landscape, but also had a tremendous impact in the national conversation. Oh, and also, for a gringa, Beth speaks perfecto Spanish. <laughs> my friend, my co-chair of the TCG host committee, Beth Boone. Thank you, Michelle. All right. Gracias. It's thrilling for me to be up on the stage with my dear friend and colleague, Michelle Hausman. Michelle is one of the few people in my life around whom I actually feel diminutive and even quiet. <laughs> His enthusiasm has no compare. Full of passion and vision, Michelle is, the, is leading the charge for a brave new world of theater here in Miami and beyond. He's accomplished astonishing things in five short years in Miami. And just so you know, five years in Miami are like dog years, so that's actually like 35 years. So it's, <laughs> And, which means I've been here for 175 years. <laughs> um, it's been over a year now that we've been working to do our part in making this a smart, fun, and urgent conference. I believe that all of us in this room believe with every fiber of our beings that we can change the world through our work. And I say, let's get to it. All right. <laughs> we would like to take this moment to acknowledge our extraordinary Miami host committee. There are so many people to thank. Their names are up on the, uh, on the screen. And we'd like to ask you to please stand up, take a bow, and shout out your name. Miami host committee. Where are you? Come on. Let's go. There's more than, there's way more than that. I don't know. <laughs> What's your name? We are not known. We are not known for our punctuality. I guess so. so. Maybe <laughs> they're on their way. All right, you're all next. right. That's all right. Yeah. Miami is a city of immigrants, a city of exiles, a city of refugees, and because of that, we are the most American city in the country. is the mixture of our people, culture, food, and religion that makes Miami so unique. We are more diverse than America as a whole. But America is slowly becoming more and more like Miami. And so we have here a unique opportunity in Miami to create the type of work that is as diverse, multicultural, multilingual as the America of tomorrow. We can help lead the way in the creation of a more inclusive, equitable, and diverse artistic future. Bienvenidos a nuestra familia. <laughs> and our big Miami welcome includes a gift to our colleagues. Please pull out your cell phones. And take a look at this slide, it's not behind us, it's next to us. Next Very to good. Us. Yeah. I can improvise. Oh, oh no, Michelle, you lost your... I'm, pu I'm pulling out Teresa that I don't know where... where I... Okay, so right here. It's there right it here. is. Thank you very much. Um, uh -huh. 
and text the word space in all caps 2305 5264014. All right. So if you do that right now, you're going to see a nice little non printed and therefore eco friendly postcard pop up on your phone. We have a very special TCG preview of the wildly imaginative theater artist Thaddeus Phillips and the, new, the world premiere of his latest work, Inflatable Space, which was commissioned by Miami Light Project and which is co-presented by Miami Light Project and Miami New Drama on Friday night, free of charge to conference attendees. We hope you'll join us. It's at the Colony Theater. All right. All okay. Right. okay. <laughs> So, okay, I'm still yours, thank you. So. Uh, now, Beth and I have the distinct honor of presenting the National Communication Group Local Funder Award to the backbone of our artistic community. It takes a village of funders to make events like this one happen, individuals, foundation, and businesses large and small, but we would be in the wilderness if it weren't for the decades of visionary leadership of the Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs, laid by the formidable, intrepid, and wonderful Michael Sprang. Michael, yeah, true that. Michael is an accomplished visual artist, and so his every instinct and his every impulse as our leader is on the money, no pun intended. Michael, on behalf of all artists countywide, Nay, to infinity and beyond, we wish to express our deepest thanks to you for devoting your professional life to the cultural richness of Miami-Dade County. It is because of your leadership at the Department of Cultural Affairs that Miami has become recognized as one of the world's most vibrant and fresh cultural centers, and we thank you. Gracias. Merci. Merci. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind coming up to the stage. Thank you both. That was this really is... generous. Wow. All right. Well, that calls for remarks, and, and thank you for taking the Local Thunder Award and making it intergalactic. So on behalf of our Department of Cultural Affairs and the Cultural Affairs Council, which is my advisory board, welcome to Miami, and thank you very much for this award. I want to acknowledge Teresa and Josh and the whole team at TCG who are responsible for making this amazing convening happen. Also want to give a special thank you to my staff and to Beth and to Michelle and the entire host committee for all the hard work that they've done. They've assembled a menu of phenomenal activities throughout our community, uh, theater community for you to enjoy. So uh, explore with wild abandon as much of our theater community as you can and get away with while you're attending this conference. And you'll see that Miami's theater scene is tactile, it's immersive, and as you've heard, it even is performed in more languages than one. Now, we would like to think of our Department of Cultural Affairs as more than a funder. Even with our 18 grants programs, more than 500 grants made every year, and in, in excess of $15 million of annual investments. So I'd like to take this acceptance opportunity respectfully to recast your award, perhaps for just this year. So here are some words that come to mind that could follow local in the title of the award and substitute for funders for us. You could say facilitators, partners, collaborators, policymakers, problem solvers, trusted advisors, admirers, tough love dispensers, enlightened enablers, co-conspirators, I think Beth and Michelle and I would think of ourselves as that, cultural confessors, and, and ultimately cheerleaders. And this is my way of saying that helping to build a dynamic and diverse cultural life, including a thriving theater scene, has many dimensions. And like tonight, ultimately the proof is in being local attenders. So I appreciate your recognizing our department and I, have, I, I look forward to the attendant opportunity to be in your audiences one day. 
So enjoy Miami and enjoy the conference. Thank you very much. so much, Michael, for all you do for the Miami, Miami art scene, and also um, just for being so welcoming to us, uh, coming to Miami and being so helpful. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our plenary speaker, Edwidge Dantica. <laughs> She is the author of numerous books, including Claire of the Sea Light, a New York Times notable book, Brother, I'm Dying, a National Book Critics, a National Book Critics Circle Award winner, and Breath, Eyes, Memory, an Oprah Book Club selection. She is the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship and lives right here in Miami. Please join me in welcoming Edwidge Dantica to the stage. Hello, good evening. Um, Teresa, just as she walked away, said, break a leg. And this is like the third person who's told me to do that. Um, I know it's this kind of crowd, but I'm feeling like unlucky. Um, so good evening to you and welcome to Miami. And as we say in Haitian Creole, bienvenue na Miami. You have <laughs> you have chosen a wonderful city to host your conference and a wonderful time to be here. You've come early enough in hurricane season not to have to worry about that. You've also come before the stifling heat sets in, though after your, some of you might have those long um, Game of Thrones type of winters, you might think it's not hot enough. There are so many wonderful things about Miami, many of which I discovered as a first-time visitor 29 years ago and a permanent resident for 17 years now. Miami is, of course, a great tourist destination. We welcome around 14 million visitors a year. It has a bustling nightlife and a thriving LGBTQI community that is especially visible this month, Pride Month. Yes, it's okay to see. We also have the highest number of foreign-born residents of all U.S. cities. There are 59% of us and growing. Miami also has the nation's second largest gap between rich and poor. New York has the first. We have 30 full-time resident billionaires. I don't know if Trump counts himself among them. But one of the highest concentrations in the world, living here alongside a shrinking middle class and widespread poverty, which is primarily broken down along racial lines. African Americans are two and a half times more likely to live in poverty here, and Latinos nearly twice as likely. Nearly half of our workforce is made up of low-paid workers in the tourism, hospitality, retail, and food service industries. These workers take home an average pay of $26,000 a year, the third lowest in the nation, and a city that is the 10th most expensive in the country. And more and more of our poorest residents, which include a large group of immigrants, are being pushed out of the only homes, neighborhoods, and communities they could afford by gentrification. My mother, God rest her soul, used to say that you should always know where you are. So this is where you are, and you are right to be here. For all these reasons and more, Miami is a perfect city for your gathering this week. Miami is a theatrical city, a dramatic metropolis, and its landscape, its mix of people, and even its weather. One of my first memories after arriving in the city is of driving down a perfectly cloudless, sunny street, and then suddenly realizing that I was driving into the rain on the next street. 
This seems so incredibly unreal to me, like being on some grand stage or set. Two years ago, I was at a demonstration in front of the Miami field office of the US Citizenship and Immigration Service, ICE, a demonstration to support the renewal of temporary protected status, or TPS, for people who are unable to return to their home countries because of wars, epidemics, or environmental disasters. There are close to about 100,000 TPS recipients in this city, or in South Florida. At this demonstration, all of a sudden, a circular rainbow appeared in the middle of this bright sunny sky. A circular rainbow, I learned later, is quite rare. So Miami is a city that likes to show itself. The French Algerian writer Albert Camus wrote in an essay called L'artiste et son temps, which was later translated as Create Dangerously, a title I have borrowed for a book of essays I wrote. In his Create Dangerously, Albert Camus wrote that the artist is, that is, another French translation would be lives, and the amphitheater. Miami is certainly a special kind of amphitheater. I'm especially happy to be here with you in Miami today because I am kind of a theater person, a manqué theater person. That is, I was almost a theater person a playwright. I actually wrote a few one-act plays that were produced when I was a student at Brown University. Hey, Brown! In the house. <laughs> one was the creation of Adam was about a young man who was murdered by a racist mob. That play was inspired by the 1989 murder of Yusef Hawkins, a 16-year-old black teenager who was attacked by a crowd of 10 to 30 baseball bat wielding white youths in a predominantly Italian American working class neighborhood in New York called Bensonhurst and was shot and killed by one of them. The play was about mourning, mourning such a death and included rituals that are familiar to many families in such situations. Ordinary ones like picking out the clothes and coffin to bury your murdered loved one in something many families in this city know all too well. It also included songs and movements that the actors incorporated themselves. It went over okay, though in the Q&A that followed our opening night, a few young men questioned my right to tell that particular story. My next play was about a woman who accidentally, or purposefully, she wasn't sure which, threw a pot of boiling water on her toddler. She was an aspiring comedian, and after her child died, all she could do was tell jokes. That play bombed terribly, <laughs> because it never quite found the balance between the comedy and the horror. And the jokes, which I wrote myself, were awful. <laughs> Later, in the postpartum, the playwright Paula Vogel, who was teaching at Brown at the time, told me that I should have been more involved in the production of the play. I frankly didn't realize that the writer could have any part in the production of the play. I thought it was like writing fiction, which is primarily what I do. You write it, you turn it over, and you show up opening night. <laughs> That's what I had done with my first play, and it seemed to work. The biggest difference between these two performances, I realized, was primarily in the group of people who had put together the play. The actors, the director, the set designer, the person doing the lighting. I was so used to working alone as a fiction writer that being part of a collaborative team, especially one that met on such a regular basis, was unfamiliar to me. <laughs> this, and perhaps having a lesser talent for it, is probably why I'm not a playwright today. The meetings, the constant meetings. <laughs> I return now and then to the form, each time with more admiration and respect for it, for the collectivity, for the power and impact a play can have, 
and the instant it is being performed on the stage, both as an audience member and as a sometimes aspiring playwright, I find a play to be a kind of magnificent dream, one that pulls us out of our lives and into a powerful experience that makes that experience our own. Great theater can open us up to feelings we have not considered before. It can put bits of lived experience, a microcosm of humanity, right in front of us via live bodies, flesh and bone that we cannot deny are real. After all, there are people standing in front of us, speaking their most intimate thoughts, tackling their lives' most challenging and sometimes funniest issues and questions, all while we sit in the dark watching them do it as voyeurs who have been invited or have chosen to share their disasters, their joys, their hopes, and their dreams. Great theater reminds our most primal human need, which is to make sense of our lives and our place in the world, and to tell our stories, both as individuals and as a community. In the African tradition, we have griots, storytellers and orators, all historians, who also happen to be lyricists and musicians. Griots are living archives, carriers of memory who record and recount the stories of births, marriages, and deaths throughout their villages and communities. They are bards, troubadours, the first performers of musical one-person shows. They were praise singers at coronations and mourners at funerals. Their power was in their speeches and songs, which brings history to the present and preserves the present for future generations. The Guyot's power is also in bringing people together, gathering everyone around a common story that in the moment of gathering and sharing makes us a community. Just as we are briefly a community when we all sit in the dark theater together witnessing the same thing. Theater can build community, particularly in moments and in places where it is actively and purposely being splintered. My love and appreciation for this particular aspect of the theater goes way back to my childhood in Haiti, where I spent the first 12 years of my life living under a brutal dictatorship led by Francois Papadoc Duvalier and later his son Jean-Claude Baby Doc Duvalier. I grew up listening to stories about the role that theater played in resisting oppression, both in the neighborhood where I grew up and in the country in general. My minister uncle who raised me from the time I was four years old to the time I was 12, while my mother and father were working in New York, used to tell me about the last official public execution that took place in Port-au-Prince in 1964, five years before I was born. Two young men whose friends and families had been massacred in a southern town in Haiti on the orders of Papa Doc Duvalier. Two young men from Jérémy, Marcel Numa and Louis Douin, a place which was nicknamed the City of Poets because it had per capita the largest number of poets in Haiti. These young men had fled the country after Duvalier's massacre and moved to Queens, New York. There they got together with 11 other exiled friends and returned to Haiti to try to unseat the dictatorship. All 11 of their friends were killed during the fighting. They were the only ones who were captured and they were executed by firing squad. After their execution, the young people who often gathered in a community center in the neighborhood, a place where they studied and went over their lessons, and protest, my uncle told me, these young men from the neighborhood decided to put on a play. They couldn't take to the streets and march because they would have been killed, so putting on a play was both a way for them to gather and process their feelings together 
and also resist and protest. The play they put on was Albert Camus' Caligula. In Camus' version of Caligula, the brutal woman emperor's life, Caligula, the, the brutal open emperor's life, Caligula's sister, who is also his lover, dies, and he unleashes his rage by going on a killing spree and executing dozens of his subjects. In a preface to an English translation of that play, Albert Camus wrote, quote, I look in vain for philosophy in these four acts of the play because I have little regard for an art that deliberately aims to shock because it is unable to convince. I imagine the young men and women who were putting on the play thinking that their own brutal leader had been seeking to shock and silence them but did not end up succeeding. After the executions, the young men and women who were read and staged, who read and staged Camus' play desperately needed art that could convince them that tyrants were not invincible. They needed art that could convince them that they wouldn't die the same way Numa and Dwan had. They needed to be convinced that stories could still be told. So they donned white sheets as togas and staged Camus' play and recited lines like this from the play. Execution is a universal tonic. A man dies because he is guilty, and he is guilty because he is one of Caligula's subjects. The legend of the underground staging of this and other plays was so strong that years after Papa Doc Duvalier died, every time there was a political murder in the neighborhood where I grew up, one of the aspiring intellectuals in the neighborhood would suggest that someone should put on a play. And some of those plays were staged in my uncle's church. The other instance showing the power of a play was demonstrated by the poet and playwright, the Haitian Félix Moïse Oloua, a Haitian writer who spent the final years of his life here in Miami. During the dictatorship, he was still living in Haiti, and because the writers who were still living in Haiti, the ones who had not been exiled or killed, could not fully perform or print their plays or their own words of protest outright, many of them turned to some of the world's first known playwrights, the Greeks. When it was a crime to pick up a bloodied body on the street, Félix Moïse Oloa introduced readers to Sophocles, Oedipus Rex, and Antigone, which he translated into Creole and placed into Haitian settings to bypass the gaze of the censors. The people for whom the message was meant in these plays clearly understood what was being said. This staging of the Greek plays fell into a double entendre filled tradition of protest that both artists and non-artist Haitians have always practiced. It's called voyer point, which literally means throwing darts. Musicians at carnival use it to criticize the government. Protest singers of all kinds use it, loading existing expressions and metaphors with renewed power. A song that has existed for generations, for example, a song about leaves falling off a tree could suddenly become about famines or massacres, depending on the current political situation. In this same way, great theater helps us frame a common story and makes the, the entire legacy of human history ours. In those moments where Caligula and Sophocles were being staged in Haiti, these playwrights were repatriated for our needs. Sophocles and Camus became Haitian writers. Toni Morrison once said that Tolstoy could not have known that he was writing for a little black girl in Lorraine, Ohio. Toni Morrison, in turn, could not have known that she was writing for a Haitian girl in Brooklyn, New York. Camus and Sophocles did not know that they were writing for Haitians trying to survive a dictatorship but their work brought us, if you will, to the same stage 
where issues of resistance were discussed with no new words being exchanged. And people we would never meet or never know, people long dead, reached from the distant past to comfort some young men and women in Bel Air and give them strength to resist. These kinds of plays were unintentionally inclusive without this even being a goal. Imagine how much further we can go when we make concerted efforts to be inclusive. Being inclusive sometimes requires some innovation and creativity. The first play I attended that was simultaneously translated, where you were giving headphones as you entered and could have the play translated from you from Spanish to English, was Nilo Cruz's Beauty of the Father at the black box here. I thought this was an amazing idea to not only invite people who might not have understood the play, but it was a wonderful way to broaden the audience. The only drawback was that those of us who didn't, who weren't fully fluent in Spanish were always laughing like 30 seconds later <laughs> than everybody else. But there was even beauty in that. Recently, I attended, or should I say experienced, Viva La Perenda, a new musical at the Colony Theater in Miami Beach, which tells the story of the Afro-Venezuelan band Paranda El Cravo. The play included storytelling, music, and a soup, which was cooked right there on the stage and shared at the end of the performance with the audience. There was also simultaneous translation on stage. Two years ago, one of this conference's host committee, I think he was responsible for the last one too, um, Michel uh, incorporated Spanish and Haitian Creole into Thornton Wilder's Our Town, which made the play resonate even deeper with those particular audiences. All these are innovative methods that opens the door to an audience which might feel like some museum and other spaces that might be intimidated or not for them. I remember once asking my neighbor across the street in Little Haiti if her daughter had come to see a, had gone to see a play that was free for families in our area, and she said, "No, ça c'est pour blanc, you. That's for the blancs, the gringos, the white ones. It's not for us," she said. My parents would have said the same thing when I was her daughter's age. I knew even then, when I was her daughter's age, that my parents just weren't sure that if they tried and made the effort to go, that they would feel at ease in the theater. That bit of Creole in our town would have gone a long way with them, as would have having representatives of the community as an integral part of the theater, people they might recognize from on the street or see as their neighbors. The first plays I saw when I was in school were on school trips. Theater professionals, please never underestimate those shows you put, you, the, the, the free shows you put on for the school kids, especially the ones for underprivileged kids, of which I was one. Even if the kids don't seem to care, it makes a huge impression, especially if they see something that reflects their lives on that stage. I remember first seeing a production of Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun in Brooklyn as a high school student. The actors were not famous, but I was totally smitten. In class, we were reading Shakespeare and memorizing the lines as instructed by our wonderful English teacher. But sitting there in the theater, watching that family struggle with similar problems as my parents, who were trying to buy a dream house for which so much had been sacrificed. I not only felt seen, but I understood my parents a whole lot better. Why can't we read that play and memorize those lines, I remember thinking. I was particularly moved by the younger sister in the play, the rebellious Benita, and tried to memorize her lines. A shy and compliant daughter, I wanted to be her. I also remember seeing Antazaki Shange's For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow is Enough. Mm -hmm. 
our shave for Ntozaki. I remember seeing her play on one of those theater field trips in high school. I remember hearing the Lady Brown utter the name Toussaint for Toussaint Louverture, one of the leaders of the Haitian Revolution. Hearing her express her admiration for one of my country's heroes, someone who is like a god to us, made me feel like both my culture and myself were part of the world I had just migrated to. Plus, the lady in brown was also talking about books and libraries, which I also loved. The writer Brenda Eulen, in her book, If You Want to Write, says that the more you wish to describe a universal truth, the more minutely you must describe a particular truth. Sometimes it is believed that our particular truths are niche and cannot be universal, but that is absolutely wrong. So many of our great writers and playwrights have shown that our particulars, the specificity of our experiences, be they based on race, nationality, class, gender, gender fluidity, different levels of physical ability, these are not niche but particular and are not marginal but center if you open that gate just a bit wider and allow them in. One of the mistakes I made with my very, and I mean very, limited experience in the theater is that I did not think of my colleagues and my audience as collaborators. Your community, the less obvious ones, the ones you are not seeing show up, can also be your collaborators. And if they feel welcomed in those spaces, if they feel as though these spaces are also their own, they are more likely to feel at ease and they are more likely to come. And they, when they come, you won't be preaching to the same choir. You will get converts. And the theater, which has so much more competition for eyeballs these days, will not only be trying to survive, but might thrive. We also need to see more diversities in the spaces where you gather, like here. Hey, rising leaders of color. <laughs> in my own life, I have seen how theater can transform lives. Haitian community organizations, when they want to make a point or teach or show something to the larger community, especially in rural areas of Haiti, will enroll community members to take part in a play. These plays will depict a situation or a problem and ultimately its possible solutions or will lead to a discussion asking the people in the play and those in the audience to come up with a solution together. In those settings, I have seen theater be used to teach us empathy and bring people of different political points of view together. It may not always work, but we should at least try. We can learn empathy and compassion by watching a play. And we need so much compassion and empathy right now in this current climate. One of the plays I had to memorize in high school, lines from, not the whole play, was Shakespeare's Hamlet. And one of the lines I will never forget, perhaps also because it's so often repeated, is the plays the thing wherein I'll catch the conscious of the king. The plays the thing ladies and gentlemen. And we're not going to catch the conscience of our current king, <laughs> but maybe we can catch the conscience of a few of those who follow him. So what can you learn about being here in Miami? As I mentioned, we are not perfect. Our own inclusivity is far from perfect. We're a group of people a lot of us from different parts of the world, and we are trying to live together, at least before the floods come. We are, after all, at ground zero, 
for extreme weather and climate. In a couple of decades, I hate to be dour, but this might all be underwater. But having a large percentage of people here who come from difficult places, we're going to hold on for as long as we can, and we're going to do our best to survive. These things might sound apocalyptically familiar to people in your field. When I make mistakes like this, I remind my children, I said, I am an immigrant. <laughs> so these things might sound apolitypically, you know the word, familiar <laughs> to people in your field. Some of you are going to have to innovate, to be creative, to cut corners, to stay open, to survive. Cast a wider net. Reach out for every hand you can. Be brave, be bold, push the envelope in both form and in subject. Dream us a better world, a world that looks more like ours and the one to come, or facilitate bringing visions of that world in front of others. Dream us a world where voices from the so-called margins are brought to the center one where people like those of us who live in this city and speak about 120 languages dream us a world where voices like ours can be heard on stages. So enjoy Miami, and we hope you will come back. There are a lot of driving jokes about Miami. Joshua told you one. One of my favorite is Dave Barry's. He says that, um, Everybody in Miami drives by the rules of their own country. <laughs> Dave Barry had once also proposed a possible slogan for Miami tourism. Come back to Miami, it said. We weren't shooting at you. <laughs> so please, so please, Come back to Miami. We promise we won't shoot at you at all. Thank you. start. Thank you, Edwidge. I really appreciate that wide-ranging and personal and heartfelt expression of theater's importance and impact and the very real role that theater can play in resistance and the way in which artists work and how their work goes far beyond their own particular geography. And of course, just the idea of being more bold and more inclusive and more collaborative every day, I think, is an inspiration to all of us. So... It's time to party, but before we go, I have a few announcements. Um, first off, I just want to recognize that we have some uh, very special guests with us um, visiting from Catalonia in Spain. We have three playwrights and a programmer who are going to be hosting a breakfast tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. in Merrick One, and I really encourage you um, to attend and learn about their work and their writing and what's happening in their country. Um, so that's, again, 8 a.m. in Merrick One. The other thing I wanted to say is if you felt deeply about this last session, I encourage you to go to your conference app, that really cool conference app we have, and offer your feedback. Um, there are some instructions on the slides here. So if you take time and be our critics, you know, there are hardly any critics left anymore. So, <laughs> right, Bill? <laughs> um, so that would be great. And while you have your phones out, turn your app notifications on because we do make changes um, and we have uh, special announcements to make. So if you have your app uh, uh, notifications on, you'll be able to see those. Um, two more things. As you exit the plenary space, I want you to please pay a visit to our business partners who are on the mezzanine. Many of them are presenting in trend workshops throughout our time together. 
And it's just really important to meet them because they are thought leaders. Um, they have solutions and strategies to offer the field. They're really fun to hang out with. And the conference would not happen without their participation. So please visit them. Yeah, we can cheer our business partners. Last but not least, if you are a spotlight on partner, can you meet stage right after the plenary? And finally, it's time to go, time to party. If you head out the doors, out the front door of the hotel, there will be buses that will rotate to and from the Institute for Contemporary Art for the next few hours. So we'll see you there. <laughs>